Um, <laughs> very nice introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I want to express my great appreciation uh, to the Simpson Center uh, for and the World's Difference Initiative for inviting me and supporting my visit, in particular, Mundi Fenwell Mundi, Tony Lucero, Anita Ramasastri, and Caitlin Paulo. I'm also very grateful to be joining you on Coast Salish territory. I want to express my gratitude to the land itself for all of the labor that it does to support life in this place. And I wanna express my support for the indigenous peoples of this place, the Duwamish, Huelup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, and all indigenous peoples around the world to have their inherent rights recognized, their lands returned to them, and their livelihoods restored. Now, over the past several years, we've seen a growing practice of land acknowledgements at universities across what is currently known as the United States and in other settler colonial contexts, like where I live in what is currently known as Canada. At the same time, we've also heard from critical indigenous scholars that many land acknowledgements offered by settlers like me risk becoming little more than window dressing, a decolonial facade atop a still deeply colonial foundation. And this is one of the contradictions that we inhabit at the present time. We cannot not acknowledge the lands we inhabit as a living entity, and we cannot not acknowledge the indigenous peoples whose territories our universities occupy. At the same time, this doesn't change the fact that those of us who work and study on institutions like this one are complicit in ongoing displacement and dispossession of the original stewards of these lands where our universities sit, and the ongoing ecological destruction that has set humanity on a path toward premature extinction. There's no question that we need truth before reconciliation, but a question that I'm gonna also ask us to consider is, is the truth itself enough? What happens when revealing the truth doesn't do what we want it to do or what we assume or hope it will do? If the continuation of colonialism is not the result of an informational problem or a lack of knowledge about colonialism, but rather a result of our continued socially sanctioned investment in the shiny promises that are offered by colonialism, then those of us who benefit from colonialism will continue to make hollow gestures through which we seek to transcend our complicity in colonialism without giving anything up. And our land acknowledgements will end up sounding a lot like, thank you for the real estate as my colleague Kasia Hennecube contends. And this goes to the heart of my talk today. I'm deeply aware of the inadequacies of land acknowledgements. Um, I hope that in some way this talk can be considered an extended land acknowledgement, one that's focused on the accountabilities that we have as people who work and study in universities that are not only located on occupied indigenous lands, but that have been also subsidized by genocide, ecocide, and epistemicide. And we are in a time of reckoning with these truths. All US universities are situated on indigenous lands. Many older universities were built by enslaved peoples and many more have been otherwise funded through the expropriation of land, life and labor. As Craig Stephen Wilder wrote in Ebony and Ivy, American colleges were not innocent or passive beneficiaries of conquest and colonial slavery. The academy refined and legitimated the social ideas that supported territorial expansion. But this isn't only about the past. As Esme Murdoch observed, we live within and benefit from, albeit unevenly, a world built through colonization, indigenous genocide, enslavement, human trafficking, and the commodification of beings. There's no forgetting that. There's no avoiding that. There's only lying to ourselves. For this reason, we must also reckon with the colonial present. Student advocacy and social movements have been demanding this reckoning. On our campuses, we see calls for decolonization, abolition, land rematriation, reparations, racial justice, and more. And these movements can be considered extensions of long-standing efforts to challenge the naturalization and normalization of settler colonialism, anti-Blackness, and imperialism. These movements remind us that we will need to confront our colonial past and present if we wanna have a chance of a different future that are not premised on colonial violence. And if we don't do this, we might have no future at all 
uh, given the fact that colonialism is also the root of the climate and biodiversity crisis that has already led us to surpass six of the planet's nine planetary boundaries. So I've summarized some of the questions that I think are being asked of us by these movements, um, but also wider calls for justice and healing. And these are the questions that kind of orient my talk today and that I've spent many years grappling with, or some of the questions. So how have US universities benefited from exploitation, expropriation, destitution, dispossession, displacement, ecocides, genocides, and epistemicides? How are those of us who work and study in universities also complicit in this harm? Why do we remain so deeply attached to institutions premised on this violence? Why do we deny that these institutions are harmful and unsustainable, even when we have plenty of research and knowledge that proves that this is the case? What will it actually take for us to do the difficult and uncomfortable work of restitution and reparation without expecting it to be easy or to feel good or to make us look good to other people? And how do we develop the stamina and the intellectual, affective, and relational capacities to confront our individual and institutional complicity in this violence over the long haul without becoming overwhelmed or seeking redemption or demanding immediate solutions? Now, I'm sorry if this is gonna disappoint or frustrate some of you, but I'm not gonna answer these questions by the end of my talk. <laughs> and I would be very suspicious of anyone who suggests that they could. Generally speaking, these questions lack definitive answers and any potential answers that might come are gonna be contextual, partial, and provisional. At the same time, we can't not ask the questions just because we're afraid we won't find the answers. We also cannot not ask what it would take for the university to repair that harm, just because we are afraid of what the answers might ask of us. We will need to develop the courage to, quote, face our contributions to the systems that reproduce inequality and consequential cycles of violence, as Sarah Schulman recently put it. We don't know yet, we might have a suspicion, but we don't know yet whether universities can right the wrongs that brought them into being, but it remains our responsibility to ask the question. So you can think of this in presentation as an invitation to an ongoing inquiry in response to these questions and related questions, an invitation to expand our capacity so that we can continue showing up for this work um, of confronting the colonial foundations of US higher education and enabling a different future. And whether that future entails a transformed university or the end of the university as we know it remains to be seen. So to that end, I'm gonna share some of the, the work that has been developed by my research collective to support this kind of inquiry. And we call these social cartographies and they basically serve as containers that support us to develop the stomach and the stamina we will need in order to continue asking these difficult questions without wanting to fight, flee or freeze when it gets difficult. In order to have relation, uh, difficult conversations without relationships falling apart. So before I go any further, I'm gonna do a little roadmap for the rest of my talk. I'm gonna start by giving you an extended invitation to the talk itself, reviewing my approach and the collective work that informs it. I'm gonna then review some basic propositions that help orient the work of confronting colonialism in higher education, and then map some of the responses that tend to arise when the imperative for this work is put on the table at our universities. And in particular, I'm gonna spend some time talking about the possibility of reparations. And then I'll conclude by considering some of the challenges and complexities that are involved in social and institutional change. Now, I've offered this itinerary, not only to give you a preview of what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of our time together, but also because I've already spent a fair amount of time framing this talk and I'm not done yet. So <laughs> some of you might be thinking, when is she gonna to get to the point already? <laughs> So I'm providing this itinerary as an excuse to tell you a little bit about why I'm taking so much time to do this framing. And that's because of this. The container that we use to engage in an inquiry about these issues is as important as the content of the inquiry itself. We are inhabiting a time of considerable volatility and uncertainty. Our senses are constantly bombarded with a cacophony of competing perspectives, stimuli, and information. Many of us are oversaturated with 
intense emotions, and unprocessed intergenerational traumas. And we are overloaded by multiple moving layers of complexity in relation to virtually every given issue at any time. So in this context, to dive headfirst into reckoning with centuries long systemic colonial violence without having a sturdy container through which to engage this violence generally isn't conducive to enabling people to dig deeper into systemic root causes, to relate more widely to the world around and within them, or to engage in self-reflexive dialogues oriented by our collective responsibilities. So that's why I'm taking this time to prepare the ground for this inquiry, remembering that the inquiry is also ongoing and this talk is just an invitation to start or continue that process. So in particular, after doing this work for many years, I've learned that it's important to start my presentations by clarifying what I am and am not offering and what the invitation is. So first I should note that I'm not gonna be offering a comprehensive review of the colonial foundations of US higher education. I did some of that in my recent book, but I'm not gonna do that here um, because I, as I said at the beginning, I don't think colonialism is just a problem of ignorance that can be solved with more information. Mm -hmm. So instead I frame my talk as an invitation to an inquiry into the complexities of confronting colonialism and enacting decolonial forms of change in higher education rather than trying to explain why those things are needed. I should also name, as you've probably gathered by now in yourself, that this is gonna resonate differently depending on who you are. For some of you, what I'm presenting is gonna be familiar, while for others it might be brand new and lots of things in between. And I just ask you respect where you are and where others are in their learning process and remember that these things carry very different weight for us depending on who we are. I also want to flag that there's no universal way of presenting something like this and how I present this material is shaped by my positionality as a white settler who's structurally implicated in the things that I'm talking about. And when I name these things as a white person, I get a very different response than when my black and indigenous colleagues do the same thing. They're much more likely to be silenced, ignored or punished for saying these things. And when I get negative responses, it's usually less intense, and I'm also buffered by the fact that I don't encounter this resistance every day, all day. As Sarah Ahmed has observed, those who name the problem are often perceived to be the problem, and especially so when those people are not white. So I think that people like me have a responsibility to take on more of the labor of identifying and interrupting colonial patterns in ourselves and in our institutions. And when we don't do that, then all of the labor falls on our black indigenous and other racialized colleagues. And we need to figure out how to do it in ways that don't recenter ourselves or try to speak on other people's behalf. And in that process, we're gonna mess up. Failure is inevitable um, because it's so counterintuitive to the way that we've been socialized in a colonial world. But we can't allow the feel, fear of failure to immobilize us. Um, we need to learn from that failure. And that's something I'll return to at the end of my talk. So finally, I wanna act at the to flag the fact that this presentation may activate some things in you intellectually, but also affectively. And when that happens, I invite you to try and zoom out and observe what is emerging in you in response to what's being presented and try to hold space for all of it. Everything from what is uncomfortable and interesting and contradictory and accepting without necessarily endorsing that all of that stuff is inside you and get curious about it. So where are these responses coming from? How are they affecting oneself, one's relationships? And what are they teaching you about where you're really at with this work and what you might need to do next? And this is again, gonna look different depending on who you are. So for instance, based on my experience, for white people in the audience, um, the presentation might create a level of dissonance and discomfort, and that's totally normal. Um, and if none of those feelings arise, it could be because you're repressing them. Or maybe you already have a lot of stamina for this, but um, <laughs> for um, indigenous and black and other people of color, you may experience this discussion as a relief that it's being named. Others may experience it as re-traumatizing re or even annoying that I'm up here saying this as a white person when people of color have been saying this for a very long time. So with all that in mind, I want to assure you that I don't expect you to agree with anything I'm presenting. The invitation, which is there for you to take or leave, is to just try and stay present for our time together 
um, and see whether you're being called by the invitation to hold space for these difficult truths. And if by the end of the session, you say it's really not useful to you, then that's fine. You can leave it in the room and I will not be offended. Okay. Now, before I go any further, I have to name that this work that I'm presenting is very much informed by collective work, uh, the work of the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective, of which I am a part, and um, which I couldn't do this work without, basically. I also wouldn't survive the university without them. And many people, most of them are not in the university. Um, so our collective is a transdisciplinary, transnational, and intergenerational collective of researchers, artists, educators, students, and indigenous and Afro-descendant knowledge keepers. And our work is basically oriented by a collective inquiry that asks what kind of education is needed to prepare people to navigate the challenges and complexities we face at the interface of um, systemic historical and ongoing violence and the ecological unsustainability of our current habits of being. And the approach that we take to education is somewhat counterintuitive to mainstream forms of education because Again, we don't approach these things as problems of ignorance that can be solved by inputting more information. And it's not that information and knowledge about these things is unimportant. It's just that we generally find it's not enough to interrupt the modern colonial habits of being that keep us invested in this system. It's a system that requires harm by design. So all the modern promises that we have of progress, prosperity, civilization, liberal democracy, and universal reason are only made possible through the colonial processes of genocide, ecocide, and epistemicide. They're basically two sides of the same coin. Um, but many of us deny these costs because we wanna keep enjoying the things that the system offers us. And we specifically um, in the collective have identified four denials that tend to orient uh, people. And again, even when we know intellectually that these denials are there, it's hard to necessarily interrupt them. So the first is, denial of systemic colonial violence. Basically the fact that our comforts, securities and enjoyments are funded by expropriation and exploitation somewhere else or very close to home. Two, the denial of the limits of the planet. The fact that a finite planet cannot sustain a system premised on infinite growth. Three, the denial of entanglement, our insistence on seeing ourselves as separate from each other rather than part of uh, collective metabolism. And four, denial of the magnitude and depth of the problems that we face and we're gonna have to face together. And ultimately I would say each of these denials is grounded in a denial of responsibility that allows people to continue enjoying the system as it is. So if the primary barrier that we're facing isn't ignorance, but rather denial grounded in conscious and unconscious investments in colonialism and its promises, then we need a really different kind of education than what we're used to. And it's not about how good our argument is or how much we can morally shame people into agreeing with us. We suggest that there's two processes that we need, at least. One is unlearning what we've been cognitively, affectively, and relationally conditioned to think, feel, hope, imagine, and desire. And two, learning to expand our stamina and capacity to confront our complicity and harm and responsibly navigate all the layers of complexity and uncertainty that are involved in unraveling the system. And this requires a long-term process of self and world unmaking that doesn't have a, a predetermined endpoint. That's why we approach this as an ongoing inquiry. And we emphasize the depth, quality, and integrity of our learning and the relationships that we create as we're doing it. And to do this, we create these educational experiments that I'm calling social cartographies, and I'm going to share some of with, uh, these with you today. So again, just a reminder, you're being invited to hold space for what comes up in you, not necessarily to agree with what I'm presenting. So the first cartography I'm going to present is an exercise based on five propositions that I've derived from doing this work for about 10 years. And the exercise posits that we would likely need to accept these basic propositions if we're going to move beyond tokenism and uh, sort of superficial acknowledgments for the colonial past and present. Um, maybe you find it useful to think about how each of these propositions applies to the University of Washington, for instance. So 
observing the responses that come up in you as we move forward is a way to see again where you're at with all of this. And that's important uh, because we tend to overestimate how ready we are to do this work and underestimate how difficult it is. So when we come up against something that creates a feeling within us of resistance, then we see, okay, this is where I'm at. And that can be really useful data for knowing what you need to do next. Okay, so first proposition is that universities' everyday operations continue to be shaped by racial capitalism, colonialism, and white supremacy. Scholars of settler colonialism and anti-Blackness emphasize that these phenomena are not historical distant events, but ongoing structures that configure dominant ways of knowing, being, and relating. And in this system, there's a presumed entitlement on the part of white settlers like myself to enjoy the intergenerational benefits that we've derived and accumulated through centuries of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and segregation. And even institutions that acknowledge their complicity in violence tend to position this violence in the past, something that we are slowly and inevitably moving away from with the passage of time. This is basically the promise of linear progress narratives. Of course, in reality, the advantages uh, derived by white settler domination and capitalist accumulation are coded into the DNA of our universities and reproduced in mundane daily practices. We continue to occupy indigenous people's lands without their consent. The appropriated wealth derived from slavery and colonialism continues to fund universities and create more wealth and prestige. Much of the knowledge that our institutions produce continues to uphold white supremacy and racial capitalism, albeit often in less overt ways than in the past. And we also prepare students to work in professions that further racial capitalism and settler colonial governance systems. And this affects how we assess merit, how we make hiring decisions, promotion, recruitment, retention, basically anything we do in the university. So the past is not past, but rather shapes the present in very tangible ways. And this assumption about linear progress from then to now are not really aligned with the institutional realities in our universities. Proposition two, universities were founded at the expense, not only the exclusion of black and indigenous communities, and thus inclusion is important, but not enough. So once they've acknowledged their complicity in racism and colonialism, if they do that, many institutions tend to focus on redressing this by including staff, faculty, and students from systemically marginalized communities. And these inclusion efforts are extremely important, but on their own, they don't interrupt systemic whiteness and colonial structures. When inclusion isn't accompanied by systemic change, we tend to just have more people of color within a still colonial and white supremacist institution. And of course, inclusion also comes with hidden costs. So those who are included are expected to express their gratitude and affirm the benevolence of those who included them and adhere to existing norms and values, and also expected to shoulder the labor of moving the university toward greater equity in ways that don't activate the fragilities of their white colleagues. So we find that lots of equity, diversity, inclusion initiatives can actually mask the ongoing continuity of inequity and oppression through equity washing. And this is not just because of the cost of inclusion either, but also the fact that racial and colonial violence is not just a product of exclusion. So um, universities have been founded and funded at the expense of communities, well-being and livelihood through dispossession, genocide, and cognitive imperialism. Accepting that universities were founded at the expense of these communities entails a recognition that universities have an unpaid debt and have also disavowed their relational responsibilities to these communities, which then opens up the possibility of potential modes of repair that are kept invisible if we think of racism and colonialism just as problems of exclusion. Opposition three, universities have a responsibility to commit to material redress. So given points one and two, some have critiqued, well, many have critiqued the limits of existing university responses as forms of spectacle that fail to substantively interrupt colonial relations and 
Elwood Jimmy has a formula where he says, in practice, decolonization and indigenization are often treated as business as usual, plus non-threatening indigenous content, minus guilt and the risk of bad press. And this also resonates with the work of University of Washington professor Teresa Beardall and her co-author Teresa Ambo in their research about land acknowledgments, in which they find, quote, without conscientious framing, proper attention to social and historical context, and the commitment of material resources, these statements may retrench existing inequities and reify settler moves to innocence, attempting to absolve institutions and individuals of their responsibilities to Native nations that they claim to recognize. Institutional change efforts grounded in material redress recognize that it's insufficient to merely include people within the existing university. It's also necessary to shift power and resources. Some material redress efforts may be framed as redistribution and others as reparation. And I'm gonna to return to that distinction in a bit. I mean, we can have a conversation about what the difference really is. Um, we, I'm gonna say for now that we can understand redistribution as the reallocation of a subset of institutional resources and power in recognition of current inequities and reparations more as an effort to enact the restitution of all that was stolen land labor resources in recognition of past and present injustice. So while redistribution recognizes systemic disadvantages, it does not necessarily acknowledge the historical causes or the ongoing reproduction of those disadvantages diachronically. It generally fails to enact uh, substantive permanent structural changes. Meanwhile, reparations seek to address the root causes of those disadvantages and interrupt their contemporary reproduction. Proposition four, universities have a responsibility to commit to relational repair. While material repair is important and often sidelined by our institutions, as Meredith Palmer argues, any given project of redress for universities' role in indigenous dispossession is one of repair of relationships as much as it is about repair of harm through restitution. And in order for the work of repairing relationships to be generative, it will require interrupting the arrogances, ethnocentrisms, and exceptionalisms that have historically been reproduced by universities and their employees. Because repair, both material and relational, should support the flourishing and well being of the communities affected by legacies of institutional violence, the terms and modes of repair must be determined alongside these communities, centering their priorities and ensuring their consent. This work is not simple and it's not easy. And ideally, they the relationships can develop without imposing a lot of work on the communities themselves, but most universities have a lot to learn about how to develop good relationships with the communities that they've harmed. And given the fraught histories, it's likely that some communities are gonna be tentative about wanting to engage with universities, especially if they feel like it's being done in a tokenistic or transactional way. So relational repair work can only move at the speed of trust, which will require unsettling the usual patterns of engagement by the university, where we impose our timelines, our priorities, and our outcomes on communities. Opposition five, we will need to develop stamina for this work over the long haul. Universities are expected to prepare graduates and researchers to confront complex social and ecological problems, but we're gonna keep doing that in the same colonial ways reproducing colonial patterns of relationship, resource distribution, and knowledge production if we don't reckon with our past and present. And we're really only at the very beginning stages of this, and some institutions haven't even done that. Um, so this is going to take a while, probably multiple generations. And we know that this is uncomfortable, especially for white settlers like me, who have gained the most from the systems that we are saying we need to interrupt and also perceive that we have the most to lose. And this, of course, can lead to resistance and backlash, as we've seen in many cases. Um, and even those who are initially committed to this work often fall into potholes, like wanting a simple solution, wanting a solution that makes them feel and look good, or assuming that the work is done when really we're just getting started. So we have to remember that the process of how we undertake this work is not separate from the outcomes. 
the process has its own integrity and the quality of relationships should be our priority. And I'll return to that in a little bit. So I wanna share some of the responses I've received to these propositions over the years. So it's kind of a, you can understand it as a general partial map of responses to the proposition that we have to confront the colonial foundations of the university. And I share this because being aware of this range of responses um, is really useful for anticipating possible pushbacks, identifying leverage points um, based on who's in the room and what's intelligible to them, and also finding opportunities for collaboration. So this first slide, we have the person, maybe me, maybe someone else, inviting people in the room to confront the colonial foundations of higher education. And then we see all the people who are gonna respond. So we have on our left, uh, this has gotten out of control. I'm all for equity, but it's almost like white people are the minorities now. This is the like reverse racism folks. Then people saying, can't people get over it already? You can't apply moral standards from the past to the present. So the person is like, you know, I don't want to get involved in this. I just want to do my work. I'm just a physicist, nothing to do with race. Not everything is about race. And the person, the what aboutism? Why is she focusing just on black and indigenous people? What about all the other oppressed groups? To the person who's kind of like, okay, fine. I mean, we're going to have this conversation. I've been waiting for this for a long time. And then you got the sort of skeptics. Well, probably nothing is going to change, but I guess it can't hurt to try. And then the kind of really jaded person. This is just a performance. Nobody actually wants anything to change. And then, well, we don't need any more academic texts or talks about this. We just need land back. So it's important to remember that this is not exhaustive of possible responses that we might have. And it doesn't also capture the internal monologue, perhaps, you know, thankfully, of all of these people, because there's probably a lot more going on in there. And there's probably a lot of contradictory things happening. And we're generally a lot more incoherent and messy than we actually share out. But again, having a general landscape of the possible replies, maybe in your own context, can prepare us better to navigate and strategically respond while also remembering that, you know, whatever maps we make, it's not the territory and the terrain is constantly shifting. So I'll share another map of possible responses. And these are more focused on contexts where at least the institution or the department or whatever is starting to acknowledge that colonialism and racism are problems of concern, but it's going to be understood in very different ways with different degrees of commitment to change. And I've kind of said that there's like a curve of, of where people are at in terms of, of this work. So recognition, basically, you know, acknowledging publicly, maybe creating an institutional report, maybe even making an apology for institutional complicity and in racism and colonialism. Um, with the rationale being we need to acknowledge the wrongs that have been done in order to move forward. And the complexities of the critiques of this approach would be that, amongst many other things, the expectation that the people affected should be grateful for this recognition and absolve the institution of all of the harm it has done. Another one on the curve, kind of currently very predominant in our institutions, is increasing the presence of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color and their knowledges through representation. Basically, the idea that we've got to change our optics, we need to make some concessions. And of course, this is met with critiques of tokenism, selective inclusion of those people who are perceived to fit in the institution. And then we have something that is, I would say is still ahead of the curve. We might have small pockets of it. But the approach of redistribution, of reallocating some institutional resources, be it money, land or power back to black, indigenous and other communities of color. The idea that, okay, we need to kind of go beyond this symbolism and this tokenism and put our money where our mouth is. Complexity is that often this is still on the institution's terms and still prioritizing its own goals. And then we have reparation, which I would say is well ahead of the curve of where things are currently at, but it's a deeper commitment to enacting material restitution for racial and colonial dispossession and repairing relationships. The idea that institutions have a debt to these communities and they need to support the resurgence of these communities given that universities have operated at their expense. And the complexity of this is that this takes a long time. There's very little roadmaps for how we might do it. And there's a lot of potholes and potential circularities. And there's a lot of resistance to this one. 
So much like the previous slide, um, this is not exhaustive of all possibilities, and they're not mutually exclusive, of course. Many institutions will have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, but again, it can be useful for tracing some of the underlying theoretical, political, and even metaphysical assumptions that are behind these different approaches so that we can uh, do this work in more strategic and discerning ways and also think about possibilities that maybe aren't here but might be possible as well. So I'm just going to pause for a second and take a drink of water and invite you to um, just think briefly about, you know, where is your institution located on this map in relation to recognition, representation, redistribution, and reparation? And maybe where is your department? Because they might be different. And then where would you like them to be? Probably there's a dissonance there. And then what are the leverage points, possible leverage points toward moving in that direction and the barriers to moving in that direction? Okay, so having offered this overview, I just wanna spend a little bit of time focusing on the possibility of reparations. It's the least engaged in our institution and um, but more and more people are interested in it, and I think it deserves. So as Sarah Riley Case observes, there are many meanings attributed to the term reparations, which cut across international law, communities, and social movements. The UN definition of reparations has five basic elements, restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition. Now, the notion of reparations uh, of reparations is commonly associated with calls for material restitution made by descendants of enslaved Black people. Just last month, the UN advocated for countries to consider financial reparations for slavery. Um, but there's also calls for reparations for European colonialism and climate reparations as well. And of course, racial, colonial, and ecological uh, violence are all interconnected. As we can see, for example, in the Caribbean the, the CARICOM Caribbean Reparations Commission, and they, they make that clear in the 10-point the action plan they have for reparations. And recently, there have been some small moves toward reparations in universities. And I want to share just a few examples with you. I'm not because I think these are like they're doing it, but they're saying they're doing it. And I think that um, warrants our attention to see what it is they're doing, how it's landing, and, and what their impact might be. So Recently, it was announced that Georgetown University, along with the Jesuits, which is the Christian order that founded Georgetown, were donating $27 million to a foundation dedicated to serving descendants of the enslaved people who were sold in the 19th century by the Jesuits in Georgetown to pay off the university's debts. And what's interesting about this case is that Georgetown's commitment to rep reparations has kind of been evolving over the past, like, eight to 10 years. So in 2016, it, its first move was to rename some buildings and to offer preferred admission status to the descendants of the people that it enslaved and sold. And at the time, some people in the media were calling this reparations. But Tressie McMillan Cotton wrote, preferred admissions isn't reparations, it's a type of affirmative action. If universities want credit, spiritual and political capital for doing reparations, then they should actually have to do reparations. And the descendants agreed, as did Georgetown's own students, who in 2019 voted to establish a reparations fund. It was non-binding, but it signaled to the university that the students wanted something else as well. So this latest announcement is basically the result of sustained advocacy um, beyond what the university wanted to do. And it, I think this trajectory of this illustrates the patterns by which institutional repair can often be tokenistic, but by which we can use that and then keep pushing somewhere else toward more substantive change. Another example that some are calling reparations is the University of Glasgow's pledge of 20 million pounds to create a center for development research at the University of the West Indies in recognition of its links with the transatlantic slave trade. And just last month, the two universities launched a joint master's degree in reparatory justice. Um, of course, we can ask, does this constitute reparations? And we might ask questions about how the center is approaching development, this, this Center for Development Research, given that development is often framed in these very capitalistic and Eurocentric ways. But nonetheless, we see another example of a gesture in this direction. 
So the previous examples focused on reparations for universities' role in slavery, um, but there are also people calling for reparations for colonialism. And the, um, the Truth Project, the Towards Recognition and University Tribal Health Project, is an incredible project at the University of Minnesota. Which, well, it's really sort of about the University of Minnesota. It's Indigenous-led by graduate students, Indigenous graduate students at the university, as well as tribal researchers. And they, they say that they highlight the ongoing struggle for recognition of indigenous rights and sovereignty, focusing on persistent systemic mistreatment of indigenous peoples by the University of Minnesota. So they document in this extensive report, the university's complicity in colonial violence. And the report also makes several recommendations for how the university can move toward repair, including by returning indigenous lands, paying material reparations, and offering fee waivers to indigenous students. And the project organizers also emphasize that this work is ongoing and this is just the first step to face difficult truths. And they say, we invite you on this journey to begin to confront historical truths as they are, not as you would like them to be. So finally, we have um, at my institution, a group of us asking, it's an emerging project um, for looking at the university's role in settler colonial genocide, in particular, its role in the Indian residential school system. Um, and we're kind of focusing on three different dimensions. Um, one is relational repair. So unsettling uh, settler indigenous relationships and rebuilding those relationships according to principles of trust, respect, reciprocity, consent, and accountability. Two is epistemic repair. So reimagining university teaching, research, and community engagements in ways that decenter and de-universalize Western knowledge systems and practice respect toward and valorization of indigenous knowledge systems. And then of course, material repair. So reallocating power and resources in ways that actually serve the self-determined healing and resurgence of indigenous nations. So this isn't, again, an exhaustive list of examples and I think all of them you know, require further examination about how reparations is actually being framed and operationalized. Um, I think, again, these are ahead of the curve, as flawed as they might be, but I think younger generations are pushing for this. Um, and of course, as with any demand for radical change, these efforts are gonna confront the paradox of liberal interest convergence in the institution and the limits of legibility within organizations that are kind of bounded by liberal justice. But I think reparations does remain a potentially regenerative process through in which institutions could not only accept responsibility for past and ongoing harm, but also take the opportunity to collectively repurpose themselves and pursue basically more relevance in the world that we have. And it may be paradoxically that by giving up on the university as we know it, as we have, as we imagine it, that's the only possible way that a different university can become possible. So by sketching out some of the terrain of these conversations about confronting colonialism, I started to already indicate some of the challenges that are involved. And I'm gonna spend the rest of our time focusing on those challenges. Um, I think we need to be honest about where we currently are and how we arrived here um, and the complexities and challenges of going somewhere different. And um, we're gonna have to learn to face this complicity, be taught by historical and ongoing mistakes and expand our capacity to navigate the complexities of change. And I think I'm just gonna take a moment to unpack the question of complicity and its uneven implications. So how we approach the work of confronting colonialism in higher education is shaped not just by our geographies, um, but also by our biographies, our structural relationships to systemic violence. As Nick Mitchell, who's back there, writes, <laughs> there's nothing about our position in the academy, however marginal, that is innocent of power, nor is there any practice that will afford us an exteriority to the historical determinations of the place from which we speak, write, research, teach, organize learn. At the same time, of course, we're not equally responsible or equally called to respond. So in particular, white people like me have failed to confront the unfiltered truth about our complicity. We made, some of us have taken like itty bitty baby steps, usually one step forward, two steps back, 
why is this so hard to do? We do not have the capacity to hold space for the difficulties and discomforts of this work. We do not want to question our benevolence and the futurity of our institutions. And we definitely don't want to accept responsibility for redressing our role in reproducing this harm. And we don't want to do things that challenge our assumptions, our authority, our self-image. And very few people respond enthusiastically to an invitation to do this. Um, who wants to think about the intergenerational benefits they've derived from colonialism and slavery? So I generally tell white people that they should expect this work to be difficult. And if it's not, they should be suspicious. And if we don't go to where it hurts or where it's difficult, we're gonna end up wasting a lot of time and resources and we're not fooling anybody, especially younger generations. They're not shy about calling us out and saying that's window dressing, we need something else. So for this reason, I wanna review some of the circular patterns that tend to be reproduced when we engage this work, not only by white people, but predominantly by us. And these intellectual, affective, and relational patterns are summarized in this cartography, the circular cartography, and I'll review the acronym in a minute. But the invitation with this cartography is to practice identifying these patterns in ourselves and in our institutions, and again, ask why we keep reproducing them when we know that there are significant costs to them. And it's not an invitation to try and achieve a stance of moral purity, which doesn't exist, um, but to try and recognize how deeply colonialism is ingrained in us and our institutions, even when we're trying to change that. So I'm going to review each element. C is for continuity, basically seeking the perpetuation of existing universities and their promised securities, certainties, and entitlements, and often leading us to approach change in very performative ways that do not affect our ability to continue securing personal advantage. So basically, I'm only gonna support things that don't threaten me in my position. I is for innocence. Externalizing systemic violence as if it's not also something we're a part of, especially thinking that if we say we're against violence, then that means we're innocent of complicity. As if it were an active choice rather than something that's largely a product of our systemic and structural positions. Basically, well, I can't be complicit in harm because I've condemned that harm. R is for recentering, basically privileging our own feelings, experiences, and perspectives, or those of the majority group, instead of focusing on the impacts of those systems of domination and asking what would actually be needed for repair to be, be possible according to the affected communities. So basically focusing on, well, how is this change gonna affect me and make me feel? C is for certainty, seeking universal knowledge, simplistic solutions to difficult multi-generational problems and guaranteed outcomes before taking action. So this denies that all knowledge is gonna be imperfect and partial and that change is generally non-linear um, and often creates new problems or repeats the old ones. And so basically the entitlement to think, I deserve to know exactly what's gonna happen when, where, and how, and if I don't, then I'm not gonna support it. U is for unrestricted autonomy, prioritizing our independence and making choices based on perceived benefits and minimizing our interdependence with and responsibility to others. Basically, I have the right to choose who I'm accountable to and how. L for leadership, framing ourselves or another person or community that one designates as uniquely worthy, worthy and deserving of the power to determine the type and direction of change. Basically, I am exceptionally qualified and entitled to direct and determine the character of that change. A for authority, positioning oneself um, or someone else as the moral and political authority with the right to arbitrate justice and truth. And um, again, determine how we make change. So I should determine who and what is valuable and deserving of which rights, privileges, and consequences. And then recognition. So seeking affirmation of our righteousness and exceptionalism and really trying to focus on what, what's gonna make me look good rather than what is actually needed. And then we've, we've all heard this, but, but I'm one of the good ones. <laughs> okay, so if we want to challenge the harmful fantasy that we can transcend colonialism without giving anything up, we are gonna have to commit to an ongoing practice of identifying and interrupting these patterns and other patterns. 
that shape our institutions and shape our conscious minds and our unconscious minds. And in, in my collective, the GTDF, we often use the metaphor of composting shit. Basically, we will need to process these patterns in order to create the rich soil from which different futures can grow. And particularly as part of that composting, we have to learn to expand our emotional capacity to sit with what's difficult and painful. We will need to commit to shedding our conditioned arrogance, our sense of merit, status, and self-importance through a practice of intellectual discernment by seeing where these patterns are coming from and where they're going and what their impacts are. A practice of upholding our intergenerational responsibilities, disinvesting from an extractive social contract that borrows from future generations of all species and interrupting and learning from the mistakes of previous generations so that we don't repeat them, basically saying the buck stops here. And doing this with relational maturity at the speed of trust and being transformed by the process of repair itself. Again, prioritizing the quality of relationships and the integrity of our learning as we move together through this rocky terrain, one step at a time, rather than demanding to know exactly where we're going and how we're gonna get there. None of this is gonna be easy and we'll have to keep doing this for a long time and learn from our mistakes when we mess up. So I'm gonna close by just offering a series of hyper self-reflexivity questions that can be used for self or collective assessment as you and your different communities move through this inquiry in the university. So to what extent are you reproducing what you critique? To what extent are you avoiding looking at your own complicities and denials and at whose expense? How might you be making more work for other people without realizing it? What is your theory of change? What would you like your work to move in the world? Who are you accountable to? Who's benefiting most from this work? Who and what is this work really about? And in what ways could your work be read as self-serving or self-congratulatory? What conscious and unconscious attachments, presumed entitlements and desires might be directing your thinking, your action and your relationships and what are the impacts for you and for other people? What truths are you not ready, willing, or able to hear yet. Oop. Dang, <laughs> cut myself off. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, who is your imagined audience? What compromises have you had to make in order for your work to be intelligible and relatable to that audience? And I ask myself this all the time in the university. To what extent can those compromises that we make compromise the work itself? And who are we choosing not to upset and why? How does integrity integrity manifest in our work. Who would legitimately roll their eyes at what you're doing? To what extent are you aware of how you're being read by other communities, especially systemically marginalized communities, if you're a systemically dominant position yourself? How can you respond with humility, honesty, hyper self-reflexivity, and maybe humor of laughing at yourself um, and your ridiculousness? when your work or self-image are challenged. Where are you stuck? What is keeping you stuck? What would you have to give up in order to go deeper? Who would be able to help you be more honest in formulating your answers to these questions? And would you be able to hear them if they told you? So these questions invite us to recognize how and why we might have failed to accept responsibility for our role in harm and to take responsibility for the impact of our failures as well. And how these failures reproduce systemic patterns that we are reproducing even when we have a critique of them. And we're gonna have to do this with a lot of honesty, a lot of internal work and a lot of trust if we're doing this collectively and cultivating this type of hyper self-reflexivity, honesty and humility takes a lot of practice and entails its own failures. Um, but hopefully engaging with questions like this can support deeper and more accountable efforts to confront the colonial foundations of higher education and enable different futures. That's it. Thank you.